Uh, we have Monica Rivera Mint. Monica, hey, Mark. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Okay. Great to have your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay. Come on. One more time. I'm the daughter of a Pentecostal, Pentecostal preacher, granddaughter. Of Pentecostal. One more time. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's so much better. Thank you very much. So I'm so happy to be here. Oh, there's a, a clock on ice. I'm so happy to be here this morning with you. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Monica Rivera Mint. You see my pronouns, she, her, and Avia. Uh, and this talk is going to be a little bit different from other talks. Uh, this is going to be a very high level overview considering sociocultural factors and how y'all might be able to utilize these and think about these concepts in your work leveraging these big data sets. So this is a little bit of a change in programming. One other thing I want to mention is that it's so delightful to be back in North Carolina. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, which I think is most of you, uh, I lived here for a couple of years. I'm originally from um, Southern California and I've lived all over the country, but I lived in uh, North Carolina for two wonderful years in Chapel Hill. Sorry, sorry, Durham. Sorry. <laughs> and I worked as a care manager and uh, as an in-home family therapist um, for Orange Person Chatham Community Mental Health. And, and this was right after I got my master's degree when I thought I wanted to do therapy and work in a different context before I became a neuroscientist and neuropsychologist. And um, it was really here in North Carolina when I got the opportunity to go over the entire beautiful state of North Carolina, visiting people in their homes in Mount Airy, in one of the most rural places I'd ever been to, where I witnessed, I bore, I bore witness to some of the most intense poverty that I've ever seen. And I realized for the first time, because uh, I, I look forward, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my background in a moment. Um, I realized that um, poverty didn't necessarily always track with race ethnicity, which I had kind of assumed, right? So here in North Carolina, I got a lot of hard, important lessons. And it made me start thinking about sociocultural factors more broadly and how these different exposures, regardless of race, can change an individual's trajectory and ultimately in um, their cognition, as it turns out. Here are my affiliations and disclosures. I have no conflicts of interest that I'm aware of. Uh, I'd like to start, I always start with the land acknowledgement. We do our work in North Carolina, excuse me, I did my work in New York City. And so uh, we acknowledge the people and the tribal nations uh, in New York City, including the Lanai, Lenape, and others who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, air, and water that the United States consumes. We pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. And I want to thank the New York um, Indian Council for working with us on this uh, land acknowledgement. So briefly, I want to talk a little bit about different dimensions of diversity and intersectionality. And then I will talk about, um, about positionality. So in terms of diversity, I want to acknowledge that there are many, 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 as I just intimated, dimensions of diversity. Uh, you see many of them laid out here in this jigsaw puzzle. And um, I believe that the American Psychological Association has something like um, uh, maybe at least 12 or more dimensions of diversity, including not just ethnocultural status and gender identity, but things like uh, geography, like rurality, like LGBTQIA status and on and on. And I wanna call out um, a big limitation of my work and the work that I'm gonna share with you here today, which is that I haven't done a very good job of looking at intersectionality because we know that these different exposures, these different assets of individuals, um, identities and lived experiences, they don't, they don't exist in silos, right? And on any given day for myself, uh, for instance, uh, the salience of my experience as a woman, my gender identity is much more salient, I feel like, than uh, my experience maybe from my, an ethnocultural perspective. But, um, but these are all important aspects of, of the individuals that we seek to understand and hopefully help. Uh, in terms of uh, my positionality. So positionality has to do with the lens that a scientist sees the world through. And to think that we, we have um, 
that our upbringing, our experiences, us being in you know the United States in this particular time, in this macro system, in this chrono system, to think that those factors don't impact our science, um, I think we do that at our risk. So I encourage all of you to think about your own positionality and how that imp impacts each of your uh, work, your corpus of work. And here I share mine as a way to hopefully encourage you to share yours because everybody has culture, everybody has uh, lived experience uh, that I think can, that I would argue impacts um, our, um, our work. So in terms of my access of ad adversity, I'm an Afro-Latinx uh, indigenous daughter of immigrants. Uh, I meet uh, six of the seven NIH criteria for what it means to be from a disadvantaged uh, background. You see some of them there. Uh, in terms of health, uh, I grew up with either no or being underinsured. You know, my primary, um, you know, care growing up was, you know, going to the ER and having to serve as an interpreter for my mother who was not here um, legally and, um, and did not speak any English. She has two years of education, by the way. Um, and uh, in terms of my own education, I uh, grew up until the third grade in ESL, which I'm very grateful for, uh, and did not go to the fanciest schools, even walking around Duke. It's a little, I went running this morning at Duke, this camp, campus is so beautiful. And it's a little bit heady to, to go running here, but, um, but I did not enjoy um, a, a great you know, quality of education as well. In terms of occupational experience, I started working when I was 13 years old, selling carnations on the side of the 10 freeway in Southern California, and also picking strawberries for one summer. And uh, in terms of my gender experience, so I identify as, uh, as female, as a woman, and, um, and to be a woman in science is no joke. And for every woman in this room, I know you know what I'm talking about, so I also want to acknowledge that. In terms of my access to privilege, because I also want to call out my privilege, and I think we all should, uh, I'm cisgender, hetero, U.S. born, which is like winning the lottery. Uh, I'm able-bodied. I'm five two, but I'm ferocious and uh, and uh, very grateful to be able-bodied. Uh, I'm blessed to be, uh, you know, highly educated. I was able to earn my PhD from the University of Nebraska, and when I went to Mount Sinai, where I continue to work today, I was also very fortunate to get formal training in community-based participatory research, CDPR. I think I'm one of the very few uh, neuroscientists, neuropsychologists who has uh, this C formal CDPR training in terms of, you know, having didactics, mentored um, experience for many years. And so I'm, a, you know, an official CDPR practitioner in, in addition to being a neuroscientist. I'm currently middle class. I've experienced tremendous support, and I also have a temperament uh, to withstand the sociocultural challenges and assaults of academia. So here's an overview of today's um, discussion. First, we're going to talk a little bit about demographics and inequities as they pertain to Alzheimer's and related dementias. Uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, my work, and we're going to think about um, sociocultural factors uh, within the biopsychosociocultural framework. Uh, I'm going to discuss priorities and process so that uh, we can make our collective work more equitable and valid, and some final takeaways. Okay, so as we all know, the United States is becoming increasingly diverse, and it's also aging. And these two uh, demographic factors are colliding in ways that have very important ramifications for, for us doing this research in the United States. In fact, from uh, 2008 and uh, 2030, according to this one study, um, the Latinx population, who's 65 and older, um, is growing at three and a half times the rate of the non-Latinx white group. That is astronomical, right? That's a, that's a big uh, demographic difference. And it's particularly important, and I also want to uh, note that one of the other limitations of this talk is I'm really mostly going to focus on uh, Latinx and Black uh, African-American populations. So we have this de these de changing demographic trends, and at the same time, we know that Black and Latinx adults are up to twice as likely to develop Alzheimer's and related differences compared to non-Latinx white, non -Latinx whites. They also, some studies show they have a younger age of onset and greater severity of initial cognitive uh, symptoms. In fact, by the year 2030, which is just a little bit, you know, away from here, it seemed like so long ago, you know, a couple of years ago now, it's just, you know, what, it's six years away. Um, Latinx and um, African American, Black African American families are going to make up almost half, near, uh, nearly 40% of the over 8 million uh, American families in the United States um, living with Alzheimer's and related dementias. 
So my takeaway here is that there is an urgent need, not just an important need, an urgent need to advance brain health equity in Alzheimer's and related dementia. When I talk about brain health equity, what I'm talking about is the fair distribution of brain health determinants, outcomes, et cetera, uh, within and between uh, uh, each segment of the population, regardless of social standing. And so the mission of my work is to advance brain health across the entire life lifespan, regardless of background. And so I've dedicated uh, my, uh, my career to trying to understand these sociocultural exposures. Now, the fancy word for this is exposomic research. You know, 20 years ago, I you know that word didn't exist, but it turns out I think that's what I've been doing. And I've been really working and pushing against this traditional universal, universalist framework of understanding brain behavior relationships. And in this uh, traditional framework, um, you, you know, we consider, you know, the brain in terms of biology, perhaps for me using neuropsychology, cognition, emotion, and behavior. But this is really, um, and this is, this is the way, you know, many of us were trained, including myself, this really um, advances a one-size-fits-all approach is typically pathology focused. It's um, it, it's open to racist interpretations, and uh, the studies that really have, are the basis of much of our research in Alzheimer's and related dementias are based on very homogeneous, non-Latinx white, highly educated um, samples, which is a problem. And so, I'm going to take you through um, a couple of uh, notes on. Um, uh, of this uh, of, of this kind of framework. So first, in terms of the biological level of analysis, you know, it's important to consider um, diverse population. This is a, this slide speaks to an overview of PET research, um, amyloid PET imaging in Alzheimer's. And while you know this in vivo method, you know holds great you know great promise. It's our gold standard for you know understanding what's what's happening in individuals' brains as we try to understand Alzheimer's. And related dementias, uh, some things to note are that um, these studies uh, that we, you know, that we consider the gold standard of how we understand the disease, right? Um, they're primarily uh, based in on Latinx white samples, certainly underrepresented uh, population. The lack of inclusion of underrepresented populations is a problem. And even for studies that do include more diverse uh, samples, and there are some. Um, the results have been somewhat equivocal in terms of, you know, the you know level, say, of, of um, amyloid in, in the brains and these five beads. Um, often, these five beads also did not clarify the role of an individual's um, ethnocultural status, you know, uh, their, you know, their role as an underrepresented population. And uh, most of these samples in these pet studies uh, included mostly cognitively unimpaired uh, adults. And, um, I could say that in terms of the plasma biomarker work, much of the work done, you know, the, these plasma biomarkers made such great promise. It was so exciting to hear the work that was, done, you know, yesterday that's been done in this area. But much of that work is also quite homogeneous and limited. And the external validity of these findings, uh, you know, really is up in question. I really appreciated Michelle's talk yesterday about these issues, particularly the ethical issues, which I think we really need to grapple with. Um, and it's also important to note that uh, that these cultural exposures change brains, right? These cultural exposures change brains. So um, you're at, Dr. Marianne Clark is a wonderful colleague and collaborator of mine at Mount Sinai. And what she found in this study um, is that greater discrimination was associated with, with greater amygdala um, uh, activation in several brain regions brain regions in the salient network that are um, that are important for um, uh, for really for um, responding to stress, emotion regulation, and, and the like. So, so I highlight this uh, slide and you know bring up these you know, these lovely images just to highlight the fact that culture changes brains. Being bilingual changes an individual's brain, right? So when we think about the these big data sets and the individuals that we're evaluating, we need to remember that um, their brains are different. When we want to start looking at more diverse uh, samples, we need to understand that, um, that it's not one size fits all. There are important changes that happen based on cultural exposures in brain behavior relationships. So uh, I've expanded this kind of traditional biopsychosocial framework to include the sociocultural and structural systemic levels of analysis. I started 
kind of thinking about this and wrote a paper about it many, many years ago. And so let's talk about sociocultural factors. This is one of the my very favorite uh, papers I've ever had the privilege to serve as a co-author on. And uh, I uh, wrote this paper with uh, the principal or the, the first author, Dr. Marquis, Maria Makine, who is here at Duke now. And, um, and what this paper highlights, so we're going to talk a lot about um, sociocultural factors uh, as they relate to, um, to cognitive outcomes. And what this paper highlights is um, the importance of considering within group cultural heterogeneity. Now, when we talk about these different groups, as we have, we talk about the Latinx population or samples as they are like one monolithic group, right? Latinx, or we talk about Asian as one, you know, as a, you know, in this pan, pan ethnic label of Asian. But it turns out that these groups have a, a lot of within group heterogeneity. And when we talk, when we apply these pan ethnic labels, we're rich, we're losing a lot of rich data. And when it comes to um, cognitive outcomes, it turns out that this is important. So what we found in this study is first we did kind of the typical what's done, you know, in many studies between group, we looked at between group differences and non, uh, non Hispanic whites not, and uh, Latinx adults in a six site um, study. And what we found, not surprisingly, so the gray bars uh, are the non-Latinx white group and the, um, the shaded bars or striped bars are the Latinx group. And what we found in this group across a, a number of domains is that the rates of cognitive impairment were much higher, significantly higher than non-Latinx white group. However, when we look here at a within group analysis, comparing uh, Mexican, uh, Mexican Americans, uh, primarily from the Southwest, with primarily Caribbeans, mostly Puerto Ricans, mostly from, um, from my site at Mount Sinai in the Northeast, what we find is that there are still significant differences in global cognition, learning, and memory with the Caribbean folks doing significantly worse in terms of cognitive uh, function compared to the non-Latinx white groups. In fact, when you look at the Mexican-Americans um, rates of impairment, they're pretty close to the non-Latinx white group. And, um, and what this speaks to is that there's something more going on when we use, we have to take care when we use these pan-ethnic labels to understand the data that we're looking at. We need to look at geography. We need to look at other cultural exposures, consider other latent constructs um, to really understand these data. And so you might ask, uh, well, so why are Caribbeans and Puerto Ricans doing so much worse here? And there've been other studies, by the way, that, um, that support this finding. And it turns out that when you look at um, within group differences for health outcomes of different um, subgroups of Latinx individuals living in the United States, uh, Puerto Ricans are doing the worst in the United States overall. This is the one group that's here legally, by the way, right? Right, they're here with status. And so this, <laughs> this speaks to so many deep things that I could talk about, but if you look at infant mortality and so many other um, indicators and public health indicators, Puerto Ricans are doing worse in this country. And I can talk more about that. Um, and we've looked at a number of uh, sociocultural variables. I'm going to give you like a little summary in a minute, but I want to deep, dive a little deeper into one just to give you a sense of, of the data or kind of the role as it pertains to cognitive outcomes. Because what I would argue to you, if we're trying to do deep clinical phenotyping of our participants in, in studies and really understand what's going on with them uh, in terms of brain behavior relationships, and again, I'm interested in cognition, um, if we don't account for these sociocultural uh, variables, we're missing a lot of really important variants that's contributing to those cognitive outcomes. And so acculturation is um, one variable I'd like to talk about. Acculturation has to do with um, how well an individual from a, a, you know, a different country um, uh, is able to understand and navigate the majority culture, right? So we assess this through, you know, through language and not just language, how well they navigate, understand, kind of like a cultural literacy. And it turns out that um, the higher an individual's U.S. acculturation in the Latinx population, the better they do on our cognitive tests, which isn't surprising. But it accounts for um, a, a significant amount of variance, and in, in some cases, um, you know, medium to large effect sizes here. So this is uh, one study that we conducted a number of years ago with Dr. Alyssa Ehrentoft as the lead author, and we found significant um, that this acculturation exposure um, accounted for significant variance in global cognition, verbal function, which we would uh, which is accepted, but also processing speed and non-verbal tests and attention and memory, also pretty non-verbal. 
And also the great uh, Melissa Lamar at Rush also looked at acculturation and found that, th that their acculturation composite significantly uh, presented uh, was significantly related to their contextually related composite and um, and clinical phenotyping as well. So long story short, uh, important things to consider include cultural heterogeneity, quality of education, which we often as neuropsychologists measure as reading literacy, acculturation and bilingualism, and socio socioeconomic status. So um, in brief, socioeconomic status, the lower the socioeconomic status, the worse the cognition. I just talked with you about acculturation. Bilingualism is complicated. I'm happy to talk about that later if you have questions. Quality of education, which um, is a very significant, uh, robust predictor of cognition. Also, um, the, the higher the quality of education, so not just years of education, but quality, uh, measured by things like you know per pupil, uh, per pupil expenditures, uh, teacher student ratios, those kinds of things they have a significant impact on cognitive uh, performance and outcomes over time as well. Um, and at the structural systemic um, level of analysis, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about racism as a determinant of health and what we know over here in this beautiful meta-analysis with uh, over 300 studies, racism is certainly a determinant of health. It's related to, uh, to mental health. Um, of all kinds. It's related to poor general health, poor physical health, and um, and it seems like the effects of um, of racism are different across different groups. So ethnocultural status moderates uh, these effects significantly. Um, and also in this great study by Moosley uh, et al., um, which is a systematic review, they found that um, stress um, that Black people face every day can lead to high blood pressure, as well as uh, significant mental health conditions like depression, and um, that this extra stre stress could actually be a causally related to um, increased risk for dementia. And I want to call out my own field of neuropsychology from a structural uh, racism perspective, because even the tools that we use, even the tools that we use to understand cognition their seats in the system, the, the lens of our society, and for many years and still continue to this day, a common uh, neuropsychological measure is the Boston naming test. How many people have heard of the Boston naming test? And maybe a couple of times. Uh, so the Boston naming test is, is um, often used uh, in understanding an like anomia or word finding difficulties for people when we assess for Alzheimer's and related dementia. And it turned out that item 48 is a noose. Item 48 is a noose. And so this is something that my colleagues and I, so I co-first authored this um, commentary um, uh, with Dr. Desiree Bird, where we, we called this out. And, um, and we had, for many years, my, myself and my colleagues, had talked about how terrible and hard it was to be asked to even administer this measure. As, as an Afro-Latinx um, woman having to administer this measure, sometimes to Black African-American individuals and others, um, it felt traumatizing to have to administer this measure. And, um, and yet, this, this measure, the Boston Amy test, has been included in not tens, dozens, thousands of published peer-reviewed articles. It has gone through study section numerous, numerous times, and nobody said anything. And that's all of us being complicit. And, and I highlight this because we also need to be very mindful about thinking about the measures that we use, how you know their validity, construct validity, and also their potential to to do damage. And so, um, I think that it, as we think about the work that we do, we need to think about it, at, you know, on these broader, you know, in, the, in this broader lens. So, what about the internal um, validity and ethics of our work? Um, so, this is a, a paper that myself and colleagues. Um, published in 2021, uh, we did a, a, a systematic review looking at, uh, gosh, uh, I don't even remember now, many, 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 I'll say many, many, many um, studies, cl clinical trials in, um, in Alzheimer's and related dementia from 2001 to 2019, I think. And, uh, and of course, from a, a generalizability, external validity uh, perspective, I don't have to tell you, you know, it was grim. You know, what we found was the representation of individuals from under-included groups was something like 5%. But in terms of internal validity, what we also found 
was that a, a number of the measures that were typically used in these clinical trials, including the uh, mini mental uh, status exam and CDR, which are common measures to um, use in clinical trials to understand cognitive functioning and are used as screening criteria or outcome variables, they're not well validated with these diverse populations. We really don't know what they mean. And yet they, they, these tests often are gatekeepers to get into clinical trials with Alzheimer's. They're, you know, they're, they're the way that we measure outcomes and they're not validated for these populations. So how can this work be valid if the measures that we're using to, as our marker of truth are not validated? How can that be ethical? How can it be ethical? Um, so we have some significant issues that we need to think about as, as we um, leverage big data, as we continue on in this work, including the lack of adequate characterization of our samples, well validate, the need for um, well-validated uh, neurocognitive measures, appropriate normative data. Uh, we need to have the inclusion of sociocultural measures in, um, in these studies to really understand brain behavior um, relationships more fully. And we need to have experts in cultural neuropsychology and um, related fields in these studies. Think about doing a radiology study and not having a radiologist. Yet, especially since George Floyd, there's been a rush to diversify Alzheimer's and related, uh, you know, dementia research, clinical observational studies, clinical trials. Yet, um, it's not with the adequate funding, adequate time, and adequate expertise. Again, how can that be valid? How can it be ethical? So in terms of how we move forward, we need to change our priorities. And I always go back to the Alzheimer's Association. You know, it, they're, they're really a North Star for me. They did this uh, great survey and published this paper back in 2021 that, that suggests if we're really going to uh, center on brain health equity to advance the field, we need to, one, prepare providers to care for um, ethnoculturally diverse population of older adults who are coming like a tsunami. We need to increase diversity of dementia care. And currently, we need to increase diversity of participants in research and clinical trials. But we can't diversify if we don't have, if we haven't divide, designed valid, ethical, culturally competent studies for them to go into. So how do we do that? Well, one way to do that is to take an evidence-based approach. And this beautiful, I'm just about to, out of time, this beautiful uh, systematic review by one of my favorite researchers, Dr. Andrew gilmar Vygotsky, demonstrates that taking a culturally informed community-engaged research approach um, actually yields significant results to diversify um, uh, ADRD research. And uh, in my own work, this is the approach I take. We get guidance from community science partnership boards for every single study that, um, that I have. We focus on gifts to both the sites that we work that we work with and to community members, including giving everybody compensation, disclosing results, disseminate, you know, providing, including uh, our community members in the dissemination process and working with community research navigators like promotoras to help people get through every step of the study. We utilize more flexible inclusion and exclusion criteria, and we include uh, measures of sociocultural and structural determinants of health as well. And we've done this not just at the local level at, in Harlem, where I live and work, but also at the national level. And I want to um, call out uh, Dr. Dorswami and Alyssa for uh, being such a great uh, partner with us when uh, we uh, led the Agni uh, Diversity Task Force, myself and Dr. Ozioma Okonkwo did um, a, a pilot study to diversify ADNI-3, which is one of you know, the biggest Alzheimer's studies in the country, I don't know, world. And uh, what we found is using this culturally informed community-engaged research approach, we, um, we in significantly increased the rate of uh, enrollment of individuals from underrepresented um, populations from the 13 sites we worked with. Um, during our time doing this, 95% of ADNI's Participants came from underrepresented um, populations, mostly Black and Latinx. 95% during the pandemic. This was less than two year effort. And we doubled, basically, more than doubled the rate of enrollment for the sites who worked with us taking this approach. And in ADNI 4, as we move forward, uh, myself and Ozuma are now um, co, co leads for the, the new engagement core, where we will work, we're working with uh, Dr. Mike Weiner to. Um, 
reach 30,000 individuals remotely to complete an online digital screener. We're gonna we're planning on getting uh, plasma biomarkers on 6,000 of them, and we're going to enroll 1,000 into in-clinic studies all over the country, including Duke, uh, and we plan to have over half of those folks be from underrepresented populations. And in adding for this big monolithic, super hom historically homogeneous study, we have uh, created change. And, and again, ADNI is the study that sets the pace for clinical trials. And in the study, we've include, we are including uh, sociocultural measures of acculturation, of uh, literacy as a marker for quality of education, socioeconomic status, uh, uh, Amy Kine's area depression, uh, at deprivation index, uh, discrimination, stress, and rurality, because we know that this is really important as well. And we're including individuals from rural populations as uh, one of the dimensions of diversity, as well as socioeconomic status. So final takeaways, I'm a, a minute over, but uh, but here's some, here's some quick takeaways. So first, we know that the United States is uh, rapidly diversifying and becoming older. And I urge you to consider intersectionality as you leverage those big data. So not just one metric, of say ethnocultural status or what have you, but what about um, age? What about gender? What about um, two spirit LGBTQIA status? Um, geography, rurality, all the rest. Um, and as I've noted, you know we have this profound historic uh, under inclusion of minoritized individuals in this research. We can and we must do better. It is possible. Uh, we're post pandemic, and we can certainly do this. We need to send on health uh, brain health equity and address the internal and external. Uh, validity limitations of our methods, which I've talked about. And we can do this by incorporating sociocultural and structural systemic levels of analysis into all of our work. Taking an evidence-based approach when we work uh, directly with participants. And again, change is possible even during a pandemic or pandemics, um, but we need to flip our lens. We need to flip our lens from one of um, pathology and um, deficits to one of them common and resilient. And, um, and how we do that in terms of action of change, uh, for change is we work from a place of cultural humility. We don't know something, find out, work with experts, put in the time and money, um, support, you know, we need PIs and leaders to support this work, support scholars as well in health equity and community engaged research, and take evidence-based approaches to, uh, to doing this work. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, this is an overview of a number of the studies that I'm working uh, with, and I uh, collaborate with Dr. Hill on the Black Men's Brain Health Project. If, if you're interested in learning more about community-engaged research methods and sociocultural factors, we, um, we go to great places each year. This year, we're going to be in New Orleans, and we also have a scholar program, so please uh, join us there. If you take out your phone, you can uh, scan the QR code for any of these. We also have a health equity scholars program funded by the Alzheimer's Dis by ADNI and Habs HD. Uh, so, so please stay connected with us there. I want to say with that, muchas gracias to all of our participants, our community science partnership board members, and everybody. Okay, thank you, Dr. Maybe we'll just have, we're a little bit over, so one or two questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you made a very convincing argument about something I've been obsessed with for a long time, What's which that? is due to the points about acculturation, the culture of fairness and neuropsychological testing, but, um, and then you pair that with the well-known fact that uh, the prevalence of AD and RD is higher in Blacks and Latinx populations. Mm -hmm. Our question to you is, yeah. how much of that could yeah. be over-diagnosis, I'm a neuropsychologist, right. because yeah. we're misinterpreting cultural differences as cognitive deficit. Right. Uh, so I, I think that it's um, it's tricky, right? So we have these westernized uh, tests that, you know, were designed for these majority culture populations. But I'll tell you, in our work, even when we account for all of these sociocultural factors to, you know, kind of, you know, fill in the gaps on these measures, we still find higher rates of impairment in, in these um, minoritized groups. So I think that these um, inequities are real. We also know that these minoritized groups also have higher rates of risk factors, diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and all the rest that, that just by, from a biological perspective, that allostatic load increases their risk. That 
plus the fact that we've done this work where we include all of those sociocultural factors and we still see higher rates of impairment give me more confidence that that these inequities are real but but you bring up a good point which is that we have to be very thoughtful and careful when we utilize these measures to make sure that we're not missing these important factors i so i wholeheartedly agree that we need to question and check and make sure that people are doing this it's a lot of time Folks publish that you know these types of studies and data without taking these things into account, right? And um, it's missing a lot of really important variants. See <coughs> fellow in our psychologist's room as well. Thank you for your question. Yes, Thomas. Uh, yeah, really great delivery. Um, one of the things that I'm, I know I talked about it, um, also Michelle talked about it a little bit, and I think that's where to an extent the field is going, which is like. Looking at uh, so called racial and ethnic differences and looking like biomarkers. And I'm really always finding it difficult how we talk about it because it's really complicated. Yes. And a lot of the cohorts that we've done, and actually one of those that I even talked about yesterday, after we have done the study, later on, I was like, can we look at the data sets in terms of uh, comorbidities? Yeah. And what we did find was like, oh, actually, the black population. In that in this in that study had like dropped all the comorbidities in a way that control the white population. We hadn't looked at that. But now because oftentimes we have like this so-called pristine ADLC, yeah. like you know, pristine cohorts. Okay. Yeah, want, exactly. Right? Yeah. And then we so we want to look at I want to diversify. And by diversifying, we want to just increase the numbers. We're not really learn about how we do it. And oftentimes I think of it as like this mismatch. Yeah. We have the minority group, minoritized groups that minor, may not match the demographics of the um, the historically collected um, mostly white individuals. And we say we're looking at racial differences. Yeah. Could it be that these so-called racial differences we're looking at is actually more about social cultural differences, maybe exposure differences that we actually observe it? And that if we were maybe to look like what you have shown with new psychology, if we look at, let's say, within the same group, if we took white individuals and instead of just focusing on the pristine individuals, we went with those that had poor uh, quality of life, we would see such differences also. Okay. So great point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and we're trying to do that in ADNI. So in, in, in terms of that 50 to 60% of individuals, who were looking to recruit from these um, underrepresented populations. That's not just ethnoculturally diverse groups, it's also people with um, low socioeconomic status and, and people from rural backgrounds who we know, um, well, we'll hear more, we'll learn more about that. Um, so, and I think that's um, important. And I think we need to have these plasma biomarker studies in communities with real people. You know, and so one of my, the other studies I didn't get a chance to talk about is called BEYOND, and that stands for biomarker um, Biomarker Evaluation in Young Onset Dementia and Diverse Populations. It's a mouthful. But um, in that study, we're working with 10 sites in community-based studies to get really diverse uh, popu you know, in populations across the country to start getting a sense of what these biomarkers actually look like um, across you know, ethnocultural uh, backgrounds to get a sense of, of what they look like in these real-world real settings. And we're collecting the plasma biomarker data at people's homes. Yeah, so we're really excited about it. Thank you. Super. Okay, this is bad. It's the last question. Yeah. 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 Powerful. Thank you for delivering something uh, powerful, impactful. Thank you. As we go back to the biomarkers, yes. and uh, I happen to be profiling the ADNI. I profiled ADNI 1, ADNI 2, ADNI yeah. go. We look forward to the 3 and the 4, and yeah. uh, we are looking at thousands of chemicals. Then we are also looking at the Rotterdam, the Framingham, yeah. the uh, community studies. Yeah. And we are connecting with cognition and asking, what is cognition? What is cognitive impact? At a molecular level, the top metabolites that correlate are things that are related to diet, yeah. things we eat, things we are exposed to, yeah. and, and. Yeah. So the issue of what are these biomarkers and what are these differences, at the end, we need the molecular mapping, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we look forward to partnerships where we can add the molecular mapping, the big data can inform us about, Absolutely. is it their lifestyle, is it what they did, is it what they eat, is it how they, and, and, and more. It does imprint our metabolism. It does affect our uh, right. whole metabolic state. It does affect the brain. Right. So this connection and uh, in the field, I think, is critical. Absolutely. We, we need that really deep 
phenotyping yeah. across these different um, mm -hmm. exosomes, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And we need to connect with the MPD and the big initiatives that yeah. we are a part of yeah. within NIA. Yeah. So all of this beautiful work that is ongoing, whether ethnic or whatever, translates. That's the right. thinking translates. Yeah. yeah. Right. We have, to, we have to leverage all of these data. So I'm happy to collaborate with anybody who's interested. Thank you very much. Thank you.